Yeah, uh, first of all, just uh, good luck to Coach Holmes, our men's and women's, our men's uh, swimming and diving team going off to the NCAA championships this weekend. Um, good luck to Coach McKay uh, as our equestrian, our women's equestrian team mm -hmm. hosts the SEC here this weekend. Um, so a lot of good things going on within Texas A&M athletics uh, this spring. And uh, obviously, if you see the success our baseball uh, and softball teams are having right now, uh, certainly setting the bar high for us and what we have to do this fall. Um, three practices in, you know, to spring, and so uh, happy with where we're at. Happy with the way the guys are working. I love the energy that we're bringing to the field. I think there's uh, certainly a need and a desire to get better every day. And I think when you have those two things, when kids understand what we have to do and have the right mindset to go out there and do it, you have a lot of confidence that growth will occur at a really rapid rate. Um, you know, certainly we, we've had one padded practice, so we're not going to draw a lot of really large conclusions about where things are or where things stand right now at this point, but certainly happy with the way the first three days have gone and uh, you know, excited to continue to keep going and building this thing into what we want it to look like. And so from there, I'll kind of open it up to questions. Down front, Travis and then Olin. Yeah, uh, hey Coach, Torian said that he, uh, he He's, he, you've had a, a long-standing relationship with him and the people around him and in the recruiting process. Just uh, what did you see from him early and, and kind of how uh, excited are you or what, what are you to see where he's come from, from where he, when you all first uh, made the relationship? Yeah, so, so it was funny. You know, we, we watched Torian when I was at Duke and I think, um, you know, Coach Santucci was the linebacker coach here and we kind of relied on him a little bit with the evaluation because they had had him in camp and we fell in love with him really quickly um, and he had committed to Baylor and, and we stayed in hot pursuit and we felt like we had just got to the point where we had convinced them to come to Duke and I think it was like 24 hours later that they offered him here and he wound up coming here and so, um, you know, we wound up missing out on him in Duke but certainly excited to get back around him. What we've seen is an extremely intelligent kid. I think he sees the game of football really well. Um, he's got a lot of natural instincts, which when you play the linebacker position is critical because, you know, sometimes just the ability to be a good football player services you really, really well at linebacker. Uh, I think he's had a really good offseason. You know, what you saw last year was a true freshman in the SEC. I think he's made the natural development and growth with his body in the offseason that I think you're going to see an even better version of him as we head out this fall. Second row, Olin. Mike, hey. um, I'm, I'm thinking offensive line off the top of my head, but for any position, um, how long do you think you need to go before you get an idea of, of the guys that you want to play the most? Is it something that needs to be done that you typically like to have an idea by the end of spring? Or is it doesn't even matter until you get into August? Yeah, I, I think I think you start to get an idea of where your groups are, right? I think okay, these guys are the top eight, top ten. If you're just looking specifically at offensive line, and I think you start to figure out where that separation is as you kind of go through spring. Uh, but I think you got to be really conscious with a new system, new scheme, new practice, new everything, that you don't rush to too many judgments because I think you'll see kids really spurt when things catch, right? You never know when it's going to click for a kid or when he's going to get confident and really show you what he can do. It's almost like you have 85 freshmen. Right? And so when you think about in a normal training camp, these freshmen come in and at different moments, each of them get their feet underneath them and start to show you what they're capable of. You see that a little bit more with the whole roster when you're implementing a new scheme. And so um, I think it starts to kind of separate as you go through spring by the end of spring into groups of, OK, these are the guys that are going to really be in the competition for starters. These are the role players, stuff like that. But uh, I think you are a little bit conscious of keeping the competition open as long as you can with it being a new scheme and being so new to everybody. In the back, Ben. Hey, Coach, uh, just going off Torian and uh, what he was able to do last year, how nice is it and how reassuring is it for you guys as a coaching staff to see the, the gains he made, you know, coming into a new program year one, uh, for you guys coming in as a new staff to have a guy like that in that room to, you know, hopefully kind of shepherd in, you know, just that transition. Yeah, I, I think it's more happy to have Torian. I think those, you know, sometimes I think um, 
those questions don't apply to everybody, right? I think what we have in Torian is a kid who's a budding leader, a kid who has the, the respect of everybody in the locker room, who does things the right way. Uh, he's a great student. Uh, he showed up at alumni functions and been a great ambassador for our program. He gets in front of you guys, and he speaks really well. And so I don't know that I'd like to put him in as a, in as a box of, I'm excited I got a freshman linebacker. I'm excited we have Torian York in our program. I think he's a great representation of what we want Texas A&M football to be. To the left side, Luke from Italian. Coach, I know you've had some experience with uh, some of the uh, assistant positional coaches that have been brought on this offseason, but how good is it to see them in action in spring football drills and whatnot and to really see them at work? Yeah, I think I think they would tell you it's awesome. I think it's awesome to get out of the building and, and get to work and, and it is. It's it's just such a it's such a weird dynamic in, in college athletics, just the way football transitions work because you know, you feel like you've done so much, you've accomplished so much, so many things have happened. And then it's all of a sudden like, oh, now we get to go out and practice. Like, and, and that's obviously the most important thing that we do is, is get to get on the grass with our guys and start building the football side of this thing. And so um, I think everybody in our building, players, coaches, everybody is just excited to be able to get out there for these 32 days and take advantage of every opportunity we have to just kind of start implementing our vision of what this football program, football team this year needs to look like. And so um, we're excited as a staff. I know the assistants are, and certainly the players are, I think excited to finally get away from Coach Moffitt for a little while and get to go to work and do some football stuff. To the left side, Cease, and then Olin. So what does your spring game look like? Do you sp split your team up? Do you do captains and pick? You know, er everybody has a theme if you're a coach. So what's, what's your spring game look like? Yeah, we'll do a draft, and, and it'll be a true maroon and white game, and it'll be a true football game, and, and we'll kind of play it out. Uh, I think the one thing, as we look at it, I think the spring game is for the players and the fans in some degree, I think. There's a lot that goes into, you know, from Jan the start of January until April 20th, these kids put in an awful lot of work. And so what you want to do is give them an opportunity to kind of go out and play the game that they love to play in, in a format that they're very comfortable and familiar with and not make it feel like another practice or another scrimmage. And so... That's the thought for that. And then we try to make it fan friendly. I think it's important when our fans come to the spring game that uh, they want to be able to follow it. And, and sometimes some of the, you know, some of the reasons why we've stayed away from the different formats that some people use is, you know, regardless of how many people we have or whatever, we do everything we can to make it flow and play like a football game just because the fans can follow it in a way that they're accustomed to. And so uh, we try to just make it as close to a game as we can. We'll, we'll kind of figure out based on numbers and how many people we have available, what the clock situation looks like and those types of things. But, but for as long as we play, we want it to play and feel like a football game. Second row on the right, Olin and then Travis. Um, <clears throat> special teams, a lot of coaches just like to divide it up among different coaches. And uh, uh, your thoughts about why you just like to have the special teams coach and do y'all really get to work on that, on special teams much in the spring? Oh, gosh, yeah, every day. I, I think the emphasis so, – so if you look at our plan to win, um, the number two piece of that is win on special teams. And I think we have a, a little bit of a formula that we teach to the guys about what we think impacts special teams and how you can impact the game on special teams. And, uh, you know, we started talking about that, you know, three days before the first practice. I think we put some good – statistics together to show them areas where, where we can improve and things that we feel like we can do better to help impact the game more on special teams. Uh, as the head coach, it's the only meeting I sit in every day uh, is the special teams meeting. Um, you know, I kind of let the coaches coach, but I just think it's important for the head coach's presence in those special teams meetings to emphasize what we're doing. Um, you know, and then I think, you know, the reason why we do a special teams coordinator, I just think it's, it's, in my opinion, it's important for somebody to coordinate and own every aspect of the program. And so such, just like we have a, a general manager who can serve us as the recruiting coordinator and we don't make it an auxiliary duty of one of the position coaches, like to me, it's the same thing with, with special teams. You want to make sure that 
somebody's spending every day thinking about how we can get better on special teams. And Pat Dougherty did a phenomenal job for us at Duke. I, I think we really, really impacted football games on special teams. And so um, you're excited to see the growth and development of that. And then we've started every practice this spring. Um, the first period has been a special teams period. And so it's, it's happened inside. We do it inside for organizational purposes so that media hasn't quite seen it outside yet. But um, yeah, we start every practice with special teams. And what we do is we do a lot of like fundamental drill work. I think that's what springs for on special teams. And so, you know, teaching guys how to block a punt, you know, how to avoid people on kickoff, how to block people on kickoff return. It's, it's way more fundamental specific in the spring than it is overall scheme driven, but just trying to teach the, the details of special teams just like you would the side of the balls. Up front. Uh, it seems or it's looking like that uh, helmet communicators might be a thing uh, this fall. Is that are you for that, and is that something that y'all will incorporate at all in spring practice in case that that comes to fruition this fall? Yeah, I think it is already has come to fruition. I think that's already been voted on, and it's a go. Uh, which then at that point, my opinion is r irrelevant. Um, I, I, I do think this, I, I will say this just for a public statement on it. Um, I don't think it's going to impact things the way everyone's talking about them. I think this idea that, that helmet communication is going to limit signaling, which is going to limit signal stealing, is, is completely off, I, I think. In the college game, everyone no huddles, so the ability to talk to one guy isn't going to eliminate your ability to have to signal in offense and defensive play. So I don't think it's going to impact the game the way a lot of people are reporting on it. Um, and then we're using it. Yeah, we're using it right now. We've used it every practice. So we have uh, the quarterbacks have it in their in their helmet. And uh, we're limited with the amount of earpieces we have per program in the SEC this spring because there's a mal uh, manufacturer's limit on how many we could get for some reason. So each program only has three, but we're using those three every day. Right side here, Carter. Uh, Mike, uh, how would you kind of assess where the uh, defensive tackle group is right now? And uh, in particular, uh, Gabriel Brownlow Dindy, uh, how's he doing? And, and where is he kind of at in his development? Yeah, so um, yeah, obviously the you know we're three practices in, one padded practice in. Hard to say exactly where we are uh, in terms of Gabe. Gabe's banged up. Gabe had an, an off-season injury, um, so we didn't list him on the injury report because I don't think he'll be out all spring. But he's out right now, and so he hasn't been able to um, he hasn't been able to do a ton uh, physically uh, since kind of the early parts of, of winter workouts, and so I think he's getting closer to getting released and into some activity, and hopefully get him out there and, and get him going and kind of see where he's at. Coach, back behind the lights on the left side, Donna. Coach, at practice you have uh, staffers calling out effort on different reps, and I'm just curious if you've seen it already, if it's too early to tell, how much that benefits what you talked about earlier with the competition aspect and just having your players go 100% every rep knowing they're going to get called out for doing well or – in that, you know, yeah, regard. yeah. I think one of the things, one of the things that we, I think it's a twofolded thing. I think one, we're trying to just get our kids to understand what straining feels like, um, and what does it feel like to go out and truly strain and exhaust yourself, and, and what that feels like. And I think that's one of the things that sports science allows us to do now, right? Rather than the old days when it was just me yelling, you got to go harder, and them going, I can't go harder, right? We now actually have science to say, um, you know, if you ran within 90% of your top speed, you're going to get called out because we know you did. And if you didn't, then we know you didn't. Right? And so there's a lot less gray area in that world. And so we try to utilize that just to just to kind of help them get a pulse and a feel for what it actually feels like when you go as hard as you can. And I think the other part of it is is I think it's soft tissue injury prevention. I, I think one of the things that, that we've really studied and we implemented when we got to Duke and, and I think has served us really well is you have to train your muscles to run full speed. And, and the more often you do that, the, the better you're going to be long term in terms of hamstrings and, and preventing some of those problems. And so uh, I think just trying to get the kids to understand that not only is it an effort thing and, and learning that part of it, but it's also part of our development as a football team is, is to, to continue to grow in terms of how well we can do that. That way, you know, we don't hit those max efforts for the first time against Notre Dame and, and put unbelievable stress on our muscles that we can't last through the season. Coach back behind the lights on the right side, Ben. Coach, uh, a little bit out there, but I don't think we've had a chance to talk to you about this yet. Um, 
as far as the prominence of sports betting and, and it growing, you know, we're seeing in the professional leagues a couple situations get some headlines. I'm curious how you all talk to your players about educating them and protecting them uh, from any actual or perceived impropriety beyond the obvious, you know, don't do anything illegal or break any rules. But I imagine there are a lot more innocent scenarios in terms of conversation. I mean, you know, campus with 40,000 college-aged men, uh, conversations with friends that, that could be, you know, fall into the wrong hands or just who you associate with and people that are into that thing as a hobby that it's fine for them to do. What kind of conversations y'all have to kind of prevent them from finding themselves in a bad scenario? And then my second part, today, Charlie Baker, I think, issued a statement urging for every state legalizing to do a nationwide ban on player props for college athletes, if you had a strong feeling about that. Yeah, um, not so much a strong feeling on the second one, so I'll, I'll kind of leave that one alone. The first one, I do, I think, um, you know, we've always always tried to educate young men on, on decisions and choices and those types of things, and gambling has always been a piece of it. Um, not so much just because of the illegality of it within like NCAA rules and regulations, but just trying to educate them on the pitfalls of it, how, how it could take you some down some dark roads, force you into having to make some really poor decisions in life and um, just all of the bad things that come along with gambling in general and then sports gambling specifically. And then I think it's recently it's probably tried to – it's even enhanced a little bit as as – NIL has come into this thing. I think one of the things that we really try to do a good job of is just education on to these young men about um, some of the pitfalls of having money at a young age, right? And, and it usually started with the 21, 22-year-olds when they got that first contract in the NFL of, okay, like here's some of the – things, you know, whether it's people coming and try to get you into investment deals and how you sort through all of that or, you know, signing contracts and, and this company's taking 10 percent or this company's taking 8 percent and trying to protect it. And then gambling was always a piece of that. I think that conversations and those conversations have now accelerated because we've got, you know, 17 year old freshmen coming in making NIL deals that are putting them in positions where all of this stuff is a greater risk for them. And I think that's, if you're doing the program the right way and developing these young men and helping them grow, uh, gambling along with some other things are now a huge piece of the education process of, of how to keep yourself protected and do the right things in life. All right, coach. Appreciate the time. Yeah. Thank you guys.